Oh, amen. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for participating in our prayer time together. And if you would please open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. We're calling it the Christian's uh, Soldier Survival Guide, and that's what it is. And tonight we'll be looking at that call of a soldier, a call to courage. Um, last week, what a blessing it was to Mark, Brother Mark Griffin and sharing how God really answered prayer in his life and spared his life. And uh, what, what, a, what a blessing that was. He shared how God helped him in his life. <clears throat> If you have the, the sheet, the, the handout for tonight, just to sort of help you with the... Uh, last week, if we remember, we looked at the prodding. In other words, that Timothy, verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift. And that stir up is like stirring up a fire, okay? You think of a campfire, a wood-burning stove, okay, a fireplace. You stir it up to, in other words, to inflame it. In other words, you're to use the gifts that God have, has given you. And if you haven't, uh, make sure you get one of these uh, shaped. And most of you have, have done this. This is great. But uh, there are other ones. If you, if you would like this, what, what are my spiritual gifts? But the most important thing is to, to, to use what God has given you. You and I need to use what God has given you. Uh, and, uh, and so Timothy was given the gift of uh, uh, pastoring. He was given the gift of preaching. And he was the, which he says, in thee by the putting on of my hands. Well, if you follow, we don't, in an informal way, we see the photo there of the survival guide. Uh, how, how are we going to survive? I mean, the world is getting crazier and crazier. But thank the Lord, God is the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always there. His word does not change. And so, uh, would you follow with me as I read verses 7 through 12? And again, we want to pay attention. What was Timothy to do? Very simply. And he, he encourages them, for, he says this, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Notice, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought to life the immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto, Paul writes, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. His trust was in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray real quickly and just ask God to bless our time in his word. Father, thank you so much for prayer meeting. Thank you for these dear folks that have taken the time, effort, and energy to come out. Even thank you for those uh, watching online. Uh, they can be watching a lot of more different things, but they've uh, come to uh, be encouraged by your word and by your truth. I pray, Lord, we would uh, take what we learn uh, tonight and uh, think about it and meditate on it. And above all, may we apply it in our hearts and lives. Thank you above all for the Lord Jesus. And we come in his name asking for your help and guidance tonight and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one has written the following concerning 2 Timothy, and it says this, The Apostle Paul knew his life would soon end. Awaiting his execution, Paul wrote to, to Timothy, his son in the faith, to encourage and challenge him one last time. Paul's only crime was being a Christian and sharing the gospel in the Roman Empire. Paul called Timothy to remember his upbringing, doctrine, and a special moment in his life when the pastors had placed their hands on him to send him into the ministry. Lois and Eunice, his godly and faithful grandmother and mother, had brought him up in the nurture of God's word. Paul had invested in Timothy as a mentor. But now it was up to him, in other words, up to him, Timothy, to continue in the training he had been given. 
Paul encouraged Timothy to give time to reading and studying so he could preach God's truth clearly and correctly. Paul did not want Timothy to forget the moment he was set apart to preach the gospel. Timothy was not to neglect the precious gift that he had been given, the privilege to preach the word of God. Are you neglecting the gifts God has given you? Or are you seeking to enhance those gifts and use them in a greater way? One day we will give an account of the stewardship of those gifts. For unto, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. Well, we thank you for that wonderful challenge there and that little uh, article there. Well, let's look at this now. If you notice with me, please, uh, where we have, if you go down to where in the middle it says, how, how, how exactly to stir up? What's that mean? By this, well, and basically, folks, we stir up, we use our gifts and our talents and abilities by studying. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.15, we'll get there someday, where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a work in them that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divining the word of truth. In fact, that's where we get the word awana, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So it is by studying. And as we study God's word, we learn it, we live it, and we love it. And this is important too. There's two ways we grow spiritually. Number one, we study, we learn more of the word of God and live it ourselves. But secondly, this is also important, we need to serve. If you're a member of a local church, and I trust you all are, if you're a member, you need to be serving. You need to have a ministry. You need to be using what God has entrusted you with, those gifts, talents, and abilities. And, and uh, 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 wherever you, and, and you said, well, you know, well, just be willing to serve however you can be. If you can serve, if you can help out, you can help out. You should help out. You learn by serving. You use your gifts, talents, and abilities in and through, may I say, the local church. And, and God's going to bless you. you. You'll be a blessing to others. And you are. Most of you do serve. And thank you for your service. I want to say that. We don't take you for granted. We don't take our Sunday school teachers, okay, for granted. We don't take uh, the people that work in the music ministry for granted. We don't take our nursery workers for granted. Well, we don't take our parking lot fellows for granted. We don't take our guardian angels for granted. We, we don't uh, take the thank you, thank you, thank you so much because you are a blessing to us. You're a blessing to us, and this is our lighthouse. This is the facility that God has given us in this time in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. This is our Jerusalem to reach the world, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. And that comes by you and I using our gifts, talents, and abilities for the Lord. Would you turn real quickly to 1 Timothy chapter 4? A lot of, a lot of you might say, well, Pastor, the, the 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are known as the pastoral epistles. Yes, they're written to pastors. They're written to under-shepherds. But you see, this is not just, these truths are not just for the under-shepherds. They're for all of us. All of us need the Word of God. All of us need to be doing what Paul instructed Timothy with. And in 1 Timothy, uh, the first letter to him, in f uh, chapter uh, 4, verses 12 through 16, I want you to notice how do we, how do we teach, all right? By, we teach by instructing, okay? By example, by our attitude, and by our action. You think of this. How, how do you think back? If you had children or you have grandchildren, what do you, you, you have to instruct them, okay? You have to, and by the way, you have to show them. What does it say? Train up a child in the way he should go. When he was old, he will not do, do what? Depart from it. Training, okay? For example, if you, get, you, you go down here to Philadelphia and you want to you know, fly on an airplane, a commercial jet, and the pilot says, welcome, ladies, this is the captain speaking, welcome to... And it says, by the way, I have passed all my written tests. Uh, and so I'm ready to fly. Oh, you thought, Wait a minute. Okay, he passed the written test. That's good. I'm glad he knows about. But has he done it? Has he been trained? Has he been shown to do it? So yes, we instruct, but then we have to show, setting that example. And oh, this is vital. This is vital. Attitude. What's that? That's mindset. Mindset. And then 
action. But notice what he says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 12. You know this verse by, I'm sure you know it by heart, but let no man despise thy youth, but you yourself, Timothy, be an example, be a model of believers. And notice he says, of believers, okay? In word, in what we say, in our conversation, how we live, in our charity, in our love, in our spirit, attitude, that's what that is there, in faith, in our trust, and yes, in purity. Till I come, what are you to do, Timothy? Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to preaching, and to doctrine, to truth. Ne- ne- and here it is again. Ne- neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying out hands of, by the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Get, now listen, give thyself wholly to them that they that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine, what you believe, continue in them, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So you yourself, Timothy, need to be doing what God tells you to do, and you need to share that with other people. The hardest thing is, quite frankly, is to practice what you preach. It's a fact, okay? But we still, we want, we want to do that. And then Psalm 100. You don't have to turn there, but I think it's very interesting. The psalmist says this, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with... Very good, gladness. Don't serve the Lord. It doesn't say serve the Lord with sadness. <laughs> it says serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord he is God. He is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his children and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Attitude, gratitude, attitude. And bless his name. And I love verse five, uh, five. It says, it says, for the Lord is good. We say that all the time. His mercy is everlasting and his truth is, endureth to all generations isn't that wonderful so it's not just for the here and now but it's for future generations that's truth all right let's look now and back at first uh, second timothy and let's look at verse seven and we quote this verse because it's such an encouragement to us and timothy apparently was on the as, as preachers tell you and uh, as scholars he was on the shy side uh, and there's nothing wrong with with being the shy side but there is, if, if it, it hinders you from wanting to, uh, it, it can hinder you from what you should be doing about telling others about the Lord. But Paul instructs them, Timothy, it's not you, it's God. It's not you, it's God. It's the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. For he says this, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. That means cowardness but of power that's that word dynamite and of love that means the total giving of self okay that's that agape love and of a sound mind self-control timothy god and how does that happen well i I think it's so wonderful here we have the scriptures here notice deuteronomy turn real quickly would you please deuteronomy deuteronomy of course is the repetition of the law and moses is telling joshua Moses saying, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to see the promised land, but I'm not going to go in. Joshua, you're to lead the people now. And by the way, you and I need to be doing all we can to encourage the next generation. And we do this by instruction. We do this by example. We do this by our attitude. We do this by our action. We need to do everything we can to encourage those that are coming behind us to love God and to serve God with all their heart. And notice, and so, so Moses this gives the following instruct, actually commands to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Like, how am I going to lead two and a half million people? How am I going to do that? All that responsibility. Well, here it is. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. And I think he's thinking of the people, but also the enemies. For the Lord thy God, it is he that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage. 
For thou must go with this people into a land which the Lord has sworn unto the fathers to give them. And thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, it is he that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. It's Timothy, where's my, where, you know, call, the call of a soldier, uh, the call to be courage. Courage, what's courage mean? It means with strength. How am I going to, how am I going to, love God and serve God and live for God and do what's right it's by God in other words God is with us it's with strength God provides at the very and then in Joshua uh, chapter 1 you can just turn it's probably the next page in your Bible notice in Joshua 1 5 through 9 there shall not and, and by the way God himself tells this to Joshua so hurry have Moses encouraging Joshua to uh, to remember God is with you he will, will not fail you he will not leave you he will not forsake you he's always there and now God himself and there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life Joshua 1 verse 5 as I, as I was with Moses so I will be with thee I will not fail thee nor forsake thee be strong and of good courage for unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to the law which Moses thy servant commanded thee. Turn not to it from the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper wherever soever thou goest. Here it is. This book of the law, this is our survival guide. This is how we should then live by going by the Bible. This book of the law, and of course he's talking about the uh, books of Moses, but shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? Why should I learn the word of God? Just the, for knowledge? That's good. We need that, okay? But notice, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt ha make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God, it is he that goeth before thee. It is it, for the Lord thy God with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Isn't that great? And I think that's one of the most joyous, blessed promises that you and I have. And yes, I'm going to say experiences that we've had that God is always with us. Amen? He's always with you no matter what. No matter what you go through. You go through surgery, guess what? God's there. You know? He's, he's there. Wherever you go, wherever you travel, God is with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's always there for us. What a wonderful Lord we have. What a wonderful Lord we have. Okay, well, let's look now um, as we continue. Let's look at the uh, 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 verses 8 through 12 here. Okay, let's look at verse 8 with me, please. Be not there, therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That means... In verse 8, okay, be not ashamed there. It means be not embarrassed, okay? The testimony, the preaching of the gospel, okay? Don't be thou therefore, <clears throat> be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Nor of me as prisoner. Paul's writing this, not nor of me. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy, I want to tell you something. The greatest soldier in the universe is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think of this. What was his purpose? What was his mission? You see, his mission was to provide salvation for mankind. Could have he rejected that? He could have said, no. He could have let us all all die and yes go to hell he could have but he said no I'm willing to leave my heavenly home I'm willing to leave where everything is absolutely perfect I'm willing to give up myself I'm willing to become a human being part of my creation that I created without sin of course I'm willing to live on earth with ungodly sinful wicked mankind and I'm willing to do what's right and I'm willing to take their punishment for them so they can be with me forever what a wonderful 
soldier we have. What a wonderful Savior. You see, that's the greatest soldier ever has been and ever will be, is the Lord Jesus Christ. His mission, what was his purpose? His purpose was to provide salvation for mankind. You and I have a mission. We have a purpose. What is our purpose? No, we don't provide salvation, but we proclaim salvation. That's our purpose. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The main reason you and I are here right now is to tell others about Jesus Christ, is to live Jesus Christ, is to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, preserve what's right and holy, be light of the world, show what's right and holy, okay? But he says, don't be ashamed. And then Paul, <clears throat> if you notice that it says here, uh, uh, just turn real quickly to Romans chapter one, Romans chapter one, all right? Where Paul, again, he, see, Paul did his very best by God's grace and spirit to practice what he preached. In Romans chapter 1, notice verses 16 and 17. These are very familiar, but notice, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 7. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For here, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. How does the Christian life begin? It begins by faith. How is it lived? It is lived by faith. It is lived by trusting God, relying upon God, trusting in God, relying upon God. This isn't anything new because when Paul here in Romans He's quoting Habakkuk 2.4, which says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. In other words, pride. A person that's proud doesn't see his sin. A person that's proud doesn't see his need of a Savior. Is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. His just shall live by his trusting in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not, what? until thy own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him what and he shall direct thy paths it's a total reliance upon god and then i would like you to turn real quickly to galatians chapter 3 galatians chapter 3 verse uh, starting at verse 6 please verse 6 and here is this wonderful truth that the gospel is for everybody the gospel is the good news that's for everybody notice in Galatians 3, verses 6 through 14, even as Abraham believed God, in other words, he had faith and trust in God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. All right? Know ye, therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that means the Gentiles, through faith. Preach the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse of law, for it is written, it's quoting the Old Testament there, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all these things which are written in the book of the law. In other words, we're all sunk. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Paul's quoting the Habakkuk 2.4 in Romans. He quotes it in Galatians, uh, in the book of Galatians. And then also the writer of Hebrews, he also quotes this book. Notice in verse 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What a blessing that is. Well, let's look uh, now uh, a little bit more here carefully at verse 8, okay? Notice, it says that, be not thou therefore ashamed. Don't be embarrassed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, the gospel. Now,
Now, I have a couple more slides here. If you can show those and we'll go through them. Okay. You might recognize this. Now, uh, how many remember that? Did any ever see that show, Swamp Fox? Any? Okay, there's a couple people. Okay, great. Okay, he's a real character. The Swamp Fox, his formal name was Sir Francis Marion. He was the George Washington of the South. And the irony in that show that Swamp Fox was actually played by a Canadian, <laughs> sort of funny, but <laughs> you think I'm kidding, aren't you? Uh, but anyhow, <clears throat> he's a real person that really lived. It really existed. It wasn't just a mythical uh, a person. Now, this fella, his name is Baron de Kalb. Baron de Kalb. Now, Baron de Kalb was, have you ever heard of de Kalb Pike in Norristown? Anybody ever heard of that? 202? Okay, okay. Baron de Kalb. Now, Baron de Kalb was a Frenchman. And he was born, well, he was born in Germany, but he was a Frenchman. And uh, long story short, he came to America to help fight for independence. And in this book, which was written by a man who worked with and was a general alongside of the Swamp Fox, this is his own account of what he experienced with the Swamp Fox, written in 1824. He talks about this man that they met. His name was Baron de Calb, this Frenchman who came over to help us fight for independence from Britain. He, uh, uh, and his name was General Peter Horry. And General Horry and Swamp Fox met with a General uh, de Calb, and uh, they met him, and they didn't know him before. And uh, so they got to talking to him, and, 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 and Mr. Uh, General DeKalb says, fellas, I want to ask you a question. How, how old do you think I am? And, you know, well, he said, well, we think you're early 40s, okay? And he said, he said we think you're early 40s. And uh, he said, well, gentlemen, I want to tell you something. I'm 63 years old. I've been a soldier for over 40 years. They thought he was like 43. He says, you know, before I came here to, to uh, he didn't call it the States, but before I came here to your colonies, I went to visit my mom and dad because I knew I'd be away for a while. And so I went to visit my mom and dad, and uh, I, I went to visit them, and I, and I saw my mom, and my mom is 83, and my dad was, I said, hey, where's dad? Oh, the great grand, he's with the great grandkids getting some wood, and his dad was 87. Now, folks, this is 1780. 1780. Not 1980, not 1880. 1780. Here's his mom, 83. Here's his dad, 87. And he's with the great grandkids. And Francis Marion, the Fawn Fox, says to him, Wow, he said, You know what? I think that's the most greatest thing in the world, you know, to be that old and to enjoy your great grandkids. And General DeKalb said, he says, you know, it is wonderful. That's a wonderful blessing. But he said, I want to tell you something. What's much more blessing than that? They said, what, what's that? He says, you're going to think it's crazy coming from a soldier, a soldier, a fighter, fighting for a cause. You're, th you're going to think that's crazy. But what is it? What's the crazy? He says, I want to tell you the greatest blessing in the world is being a friend of God. Is being God's friend. Being a friend of God. And they go, you know, like, wow. Oh, that's real. Wow. You know, they, and uh, I thought, what a blessing that was, that man. And sadly, a month later, General DeKalb was killed. He was stabbed 11 times with a bayonet. And a few days later, he died. But what a testimony. He was to these other generals 
He said, the most important thing in life is have God as your friend, is friendship with God, friendship in heaven. And I, and I read that. Boy, did that touch my heart. And here's a man who, who uh, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't have to come here and fight for free. He didn't have to fight for us. He didn't, you know, he could have just said, well, I'll enjoy retirement. I'll take it easy. But he thought freedom is much more important. Freedom is much more important. And I was just unbelievably blessed by reading about that and encouraged about that. Well, let's charge onward, okay? Notice, how does salvation happen? Okay, how, this is the question. How does salvation happen? Well, if you notice here <clears throat> what we find, the salvation, verse 9. For who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works? We're not, we know this. It's basic, not saved by works. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You see, God knew that you and I would have to have a Savior before we were even created. He knew we would need to be saved. He knew we would be sinners that were lost and needed a Savior. So way back. Now, what I'd like you to turn to is Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul writes this wonderful epistle of course, you know, Timothy, they believe he was the pastor of, of the church of Ephesus. But I'd like us to notice in verse 7, Ephesians chapter 1, if you turn there, please, in verse 7, notice this. In whom, uh, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom, he's talking about Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made none unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Now notice this, that, they, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom also you trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have the Holy Spirit. When a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells them, which is the earnest, that's a guarantee, that's a down payment of our inheritance unto the redemption, the purchased possession, under the praise of his glory, and the praise of his glory. And I think I can say verses 7 through uh, verse 14. I could be wrong here, but according to my Bible, that's one sentence. <laughs> Remember in grammar school, right? Or seventh grade? A sentence is a complete thought. I mean, you know, one word can be a sentence. But isn't that interesting? God had this all worked out. But I want you to notice that the importance, we have to trust Jesus Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After ye heard the word of truth, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God the word of God and then it just turn a page how does this happen how how does that ha how do here it is here how am I saved how am I forgiven for by grace it's God's undeserved unmerited favor you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast it's God's gift we can't do it for we now this is what we are to do we are to be good people we are to have good works, not to get to heaven, but because we are going to heaven, not to get forgiven, but because we are forgiven. For, for it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained 
that we should walk in them. We should walk in them. And uh, just real quickly, in closing, closing scripture here, in Matthew uh, 18, uh, Matthew 28, excuse me, verse 19. As you'll hear Pastor Wendell describe this, okay? When he, in fact, uh, October 22nd, we're having another baptismal service. And Pastor Wendell will say something like this, all right? Uh, I'm baptizing you in the name of what? The Father and, and what? Right, exactly. You see, it's the work of the triune God, okay? Uh, that's exactly what it says. And here it is. You see, the Father authored the plan of salvation. The Son is the one who accomplished the plan of salvation. And the Holy Spirit is the one who applies the plan of salvation. The Holy Spirit is the one who takes the word of God convicts us of our sin and convinces us of the need of Jesus Christ need of Jesus Christ so it is the work of the triune God the triune God <clears throat> and, uh, and and to help us a little bit understand this okay could you go to the next next slide I think I have one more slide have one, there we go okay that, and I really appreciate this gentleman we'll turn uh, his name is Francis Schaefer he's with the Lord he died in 1984 Four, he was 72 years old. Now, this man spoke in my graduation from seminary, my, 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 my ser- the graduation ceremony. And he was battling cancer. He was in so much pain that my, my, one of my fellow students' wives, who was a nurse, had to give him a, a shot so he could speak. And he was used greatly of God in, back in the 1970s uh, 60s and 70s or something to, to, he, he stood for the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and he really really helped uh, people can we, go to the, can we go to the PowerPoint real quick okay here it is uh, okay the next one please okay next one we said that okay next one alright here it is this is very very helpful okay uh, and my time is slipping by here quickly but he's the one who helped Francis Schaeffer, it really helped me out to understand. Think of truth as a circle, as a sphere. Don't think of it as a point. Point, that's it. But think of it as a circle, truth, okay? And then the next slide. You see, you have truth, and then you have non-truth. You have reality and what is not real, okay? Think of it. Okay, the next one, next circle. Okay, so... A lot of things that you hear preachers preach, okay? You, you say, well, it sort of sounds like a contra- contradiction. They're not exactly really a contradiction. Truth is a circle. Just as a, um, uh, we, we think of the person of Christ. Can you go back one? One more. Back. Okay, yeah, stay there, stay there. Now, is it true that Jesus is God? Yes. Is it true that Jesus is man? Okay, now, if I get to the point where I say Jesus isn't God, Jesus is not man, which the Apostle John had to deal with because they said, oh, no, he can't be real. It just looks like he's real, okay? He just looks like he's human. Well, that's non-truth. You see what I'm saying? You have truth and you have non-truth. Okay, thank you. That's perfect. The next slide, back to the... Thank you. And a lot of these issues that we face and, and you hear... In fact, books have been written, seminars are, are written. Uh, probably a lot of people lose money, quite frankly, because they have seminars. Even denominations have divided over it, these things. But they're not contradictions. They're not contradictions, okay? They're within the circle of truth. Lordship salvation. Oh, you know, uh, oh, you're one of those easy believism type people. Wait a minute. Do you know that John never uses the word repent? The Apostle John? Would you say he's an easy believism? No, we believe in repentance. It's the same coin. Repent means change of mind. If I really believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm changing my mind. It's not a contradiction. If I really believe, I'm repenting. Lord, and so you say, oh, you, you, you know, oh, you believe in getting saved, and then, then, uh, you, then, uh, then Jesus becomes your Lord. Let me ask you something. Anytime you and I sin, anytime we sin, who's on the throne of our heart? 
Who's on the throne of our heart anytime we sin? We are, not the Lord. Not the Lord. When I sin, God isn't ruling my heart. He's not ruling my life. He should. He should be. I should allow him. So lordship is salvation. Who is Lord in our life whenever we sin? We are. Repentance, change of mind, and belief. They're both involved. They're the same coin. Repent, believe. Okay, elect, chosen by God. We are chosen by God. However, salvation, whoever believes is a contradiction, chosen in Christ before the world began. Whosoever believeth in him shall not be saved. If I say, if I say, oh, that's not true. You're not chosen in Christ before the world began. That's non-truth. Oh, but if I say, oh, that's not true. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not true. That's non-truth. It is true. They are both true. They're both true. We want to be biblicists. We want to go by the Bible, okay? And then prayer. I want to ask you something. Does God know, does God know the end of the world? Does God know everything that's going to happen? Yeah, he does, right? He's all-knowing. All right? Now, well, it's silly to pray because God's already ordained it. God's already put, put God knows all about it. Ah, oh, but guess what? He's ordained the means. That's why he tells us to pray. That's why he commands us. Jesus said men always ought to pray and not to faint because he's ordained the means to that end, and that is prayer. Prayer makes God happy because we're acknowledging him, we're obeying him, we're doing what he tells us to do. You see, the gospel is for everybody. If anybody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. They will be saved. That's what it's all about. So a lot of these things that, 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 that quite frankly, I'm going to be blunt with you. I'm going to be blunt because I've seen it all my life where preachers get up there and say things and things like that. And, oh, yeah. In other words, it's almost like they're egotistical. I'm going to tell you right now. They're egotistical. They write books. And by the way, you know what a lot of pastors do and a lot of preachers do? They write a book. Oh, yeah, that guy's right. Oh, yeah, that guy's right. No, they might be right. I don't know. I'm not saying. And I'm not saying don't, don't write. But in almost it's like I wanna, I, I, I'm a little bit more spiritual than you. I'm a little bit more knowledgeable than you. That's an abomination to God. That's an abomination to God. And so uh, <clears throat> I thank the Lord for this is so, 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 so helpful to me. In other words, you... I can say that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. God didn't say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to ever, whoever's going to accept it. Is that what we said? Whoever's going to accept it, you, pre you preach it. Don't you preach to everybody. No, 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 no. You just preach to those who are elect. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, who are they? Oh, you don't know, because that's God's business. Evangelism's our business. See what I'm saying? And, it's, and so you and I need to be doing what the Bible says. This is what Timothy needs to be doing, what the Bible says. You're here tonight. You know what? God's going to bless you because you're here tonight. You're listening to the Word of God. You're seeking to honor God and pray with Him for each other. And may we, by the grace of God, do all that we can to encourage one another with our walk with the Lord. I didn't get to it, but if you look at that wonderful song we'll sing it next week first thing we'll do is we'll sing that song i know whom i have believed and he is able to keep that which i've committed unto him against that day let's pray lord thank you so much for your truth sanctify them through thy word thy word is truth thank you for forgiving us for our sins thank you for being there for us never leaving us never forsaking us never failing us and thank you for these dear folks that have taken the time, effort, and energy, Lord, to come out to prayer meeting. Lord, bless them. I thank you for those even watching online. Lord, again, they could be watching many, many things. Bless them mightily. I pray you continue to bless the Iwana program, the marriage series, and the discipleship going on. And pray your blessing on the services here throughout the world. May people come to know Jesus as their Savior on the Lord's Day, that people will be saved, especially here at VFBT. And believers, may we come more like your wonderful son. And it's his name we pray. Amen.